Hello, hello. My name is Allison Co. I'm a hypnotherapist coming to you from Portland, Oregon, sharing with you today a session I had with an amazing client who has been a consultant in corporate America for the last 20 years. She's been a speaker, a coach, um, facilitating in-person classes to large groups, so usually a new group each wet, each week in a new city. But in her free time, she does a lot of energy work for her family. She does a lot of clearing. She does a lot of readings. She is an amazing, high-functioning, beautiful person, and she's out there making a difference in the world. She had a session with me, and it's really cool how her session utilizes a lot of her work with others, a lot of this work in translating what people need into words that they can understand and, and, and analogies they can understand, because this was really a helpful tool in this session. You'll find a lot of back and forth between us, a lot of, you know, question and answer, constant question and answer between us. A lot of times we're speaking to other people in this session, in her session, we're speaking to others. So she's like a, a, a translator of this information that's coming through. So her skills are really, really utilized today. And you'll get to see how annoying I am when we get, when we get into these sessions. And I ask so many dang questions. And I can tell how annoying I am because I have to read my part. And I've already tried like a couple times to record this. And I'm like, oh, would she shut up? And I'm talking about me. And I won't because that's my job. And I just got to get through it. All right. So bear with me. So we're opening up this session with this beautiful client and she's outdoors in the sky floating. And she said she's floating in this beautiful sky. That's kind of a combination of yellow and blue kind of swirls together, not making green, but just different, different layers of yellow and blue. And she can't really see the bottom, but she feels like she's in an atmosphere so around a planet, but it's not just light. She just can't find the bottom. So I'm asking her to see if she can go somewhere a little bit closer. She says, well, I just asked to go somewhere there where there's activity or terrain. And so I was guided downward and it looks like a forest. There's a lot of green. I'm guided downward. I see a lot of trees and they're short. They're way shorter than I'm used to. And I ask, okay, before we go all the way to the surface, let's look around a little bit from this higher perspective. What else do you notice about this land? Well, it's like the rolling terrain of these green trees that from this perspective just look like clumps of cotton balls and they're dark green and it looks densely populated with green. All right. Do you see any life forms? Not from up here. Okay, and do you see any water? No, I don't see water, but I hear water. Can you follow that sound? I also hear music, and it's easier to go to the music than the water. It's like, I don't know how to describe it. I'm hearing lute music. I don't even know what a lute is, but it looks like a celebration. Nothing special. It doesn't feel like anybody's celebrating an event or anything. It's just like the way of life there. Very good. And who are these beings that you're watching? Well, from my perspective, they look small compared to what I'm used to, like three feet tall. There's a lot of them. Do they just look like short humans or do they look very different than humans? They have a human form, but they look different. Their faces look different. Their hands and their feet are more bulbous. Their faces are more rounded, like bigger noses, more bulbous overall. And do they seem to be male and female? Yes, I just see more males, but I sense females too. And do they see you or are you invisible to them? 
well, they don't seem to be paying attention to me, but I don't know if that means that they see me or not. If they see me, they don't care. And would you like to explore them further? Or would you like to move on? I think move on. Okay, let's go ahead. What draws your attention now? Well, I think there's one that wants to talk, actually. It feels like I was hasty to move on. Okay, so they're ready to interact with you? One is, yes. Tell me about this one. He's the one who immediately I was describing. I mean, the rest kind of look like him. But his skin is, well, gray is not the right word. But I'm going to go with gray. And he's kind of scruffy, almost in a way an old man would come across scruffy. He just has that elder wisdom or elder gruffness to him. He's asking why I'm here. And I say, okay, that's a legit question. Would you like to tell him the truth? Yeah, I think the truth is usually the best option. I just don't know what to tell him. You can tell him you're just visiting and that you heard the music. He seems fine with that response. He's leading me toward a fire, like a bonfire type thing where there are a few others. There's probably like six or eight more at the bonfire. It almost feels like he's introducing me around or essentially just explaining my presence. They're not very interested, though. It's not like introductions, but a couple of them seem interested in my arrival. And they're, they're both female. And how do you appear now in this place? Let's take a look at you. I'm quite a bit taller than they are. Maybe double the size. And the word I would use to describe it is uh, wispy. Like almost like made of ether or fairy wings. I mean, it's hard to describe. It's like if wind and light took form. Okay, beautiful. Other than that, do you have more of a humanoid shape then? Yes, but I wouldn't describe it as humanoid, only that I'm bipedal. Very good. And would you like to ask them anything? Well, it feels to me like the others that aren't interested can't see me. They completely understand and respect what the man is saying, but they don't just they just don't see it. So they aren't interested. The two females can, so I'm going to ask why they're interested in seeing me or why they could see me when it seems like others can't. And they said because they're well, they're describing it like a faucet that drips information. Hmm, I don't know how else to describe it. Well, does that mean that they get some of the information that others maybe don't? Yeah, it, it feels that way. They're essentially showing me like the ropes or threads. They grab onto these threads and they can unravel the threads. And it's a metaphor, of course. It's not about ropes and threads. It's about how these ropes are coming down from, well, from my perspective, I call it source. They're coming up from the higher, coming up from the cosmos. So it's like they're getting these threads, these divine threads, and it's their job to unravel them. Unraveling keeps coming through. I mean, I would have the context of a rope and it's all a braided rope. That's how it comes to them. It's, it's all braided and they need to unravel it and make it all smooth. And it's almost like if you had a pony and you're brushing its tail. Very good. And what have they figured out about you? They said, I'm like them. Not in a sense that I belong in their reality, but more in a sense that that's what I do in mine. Oh, interesting. Okay. Do they have any tips for you on how, how to get in further with the unbraiding and translate information that they receive? Well, they first were showing me these little tools I mean, the best I could use from my perception is like a brush. You can use a tool to help you comb it, but a lot of time they're just using their fingers the way that they're showing me. It goes along with the singing and the dancing that's all around. It's a very joyous thing to do. It's like they're having fun with it. They're just playing with the ropes of energy, and it's like they're flowing, they're flowing them around. 
they're singing with them, they're dancing with them, and that's how they naturally get them to unbraid. And then as that's happening, it's almost like that light from the ropes, the ropes are almost light-based, you know? So they're, as they're doing it, it's like the light flows these thin patterns toward other members of their community. So does that mean that eventually the other members of the commu community will be able to tell that you're there, for example? I don't get that sense. They're just essentially showing me what they do. So they receive this light and then they transform it. They receive it in chunks in these packages, kind of like downloading a stream of information in this rope. And then when they're embracing it or they're separating it out, it's not like they're directing it to where it goes, but it's like they're allowing the space for it then, like, the, like that faucet, to flow where it needs to go. And the way that I'm seeing it flow, it goes to specific members of the community. It's not like they're just flowing it around into trees and that kind of stuff. Okay, very interesting. So they're saying that you should be able to do this by using these tools and unraveling, maybe using another tool like they do, which is more joyous than nature and fun and singing and play in order to unravel these. Yes, they're saying that's how they do it, but snarky, snarky, not snarky, but like, well, you asked us how to do this. And it's essentially telling me that we're not telling you how to do your own job. We're showing you how we do ours to help give you another option. And that's exactly what we asked for, right? Any tips they had? Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay. So can they give us an example of some of the information that has come through besides you and your presence here? What is some of the information that they generally access in this way? The first word I heard was healing. But in this type of a dynamic environment, whatever it would be called, uh, healing isn't as big of a deal as it would be in other places because they stay really close to balance anyway. So maybe that's more what it is, flowing, flowing that balance that needs to occur to keep their physical form intact is how I heard it. So, so healing, I'm asking what else, what else does this do? Oh, I'm also hearing that it helps them stay safe. They're telling me that it's not dangerous where, where they are, and they're not worried about predators, but there's something to do with the idea that if they get information before something occurs, it helps them the, be prepared and safe. Do what they do, what do they call this planet that they live on? Mm, I don't know if I can pronounce it. Kind of like Sherlock or something. <laughs> are they the only kind of advanced beings on this planet? Or are there others? They say that there are others. They're showing me other others there, almost like clumps. They gather together in clumps. Very good. Okay, would you like to meet any of the others? Or would you like to ask more questions of these individuals? Hold on. I'm just asking if there's anything else that they think that I should learn from them while I'm here. And I'm getting nothing. Oh, okay. I do want to ask one question before we go off, though. I just want to ask them if they know about Earth. Earth at this present time that we're in. They said, yes, Earth. Uh, hold on. Can we ask the question again? Okay. Yes. I'm wondering if they know about earth at that's present time. Sorry. It's all jumbled up. Originally when they said the thing about knowing about earth, it felt like, oh, that poor planet. And then it got jumbled up with at this present point in time. It's kind of harder to hear. Okay. Well, let's maybe separate those questions out. Do they know about earth? They know about Earth, yes, although I also heard which one. <laughs> okay. How many do they view? Three. Okay. Can they distinguish between the three? They're basically showing me how they sit on top of each other. They're saying that because they sit on top of each other, it's kind of harder for them to distinguish between the three. And do they know about Earth at this time? What do they see at this time from their perspective? Hold on. I need to tell them what time. 
that was the, immediately the question from them. What time? So what they're showing me is, this is really hard to describe, but if you could have three marbles that were stacked on top of each other and they also had motion, it's like all three of them are moving in a way where sometimes they overlap perfectly and sometimes they don't. Because all three of them are in constant motion, it's always not quite the right overlap and fit. And there's something else with it. They're saying fitting and overlapping perfectly is not the goal. They're stressing that that's not the important part. They're just trying to show me the motion. It's a pattern too. What do they see is happening on earth right now or on the earths right now? It's kind of like they're showing me that it, it, it's really hard to describe. There's an awareness where all of them are becoming more and more aware of the others, of the other three earths that they perceive. Okay. And what is the catalyst for them, for that to happen, that awareness? I heard it's time. And I'm also seeing it with ripples of light. But it's not from one source. It's ripples of light from multiple sources, multiple and strong and from more than one source. Very good. Okay. So the ripples of light are coming. Are they coming from outside or being generated from inside? Outside. Okay. One is close from my perspective. I would say like the distance of the sun. The other one is, well, I can't see it. It's not in my view. It's coming from further or other ones because I don't know if it's more than one. And ultimately they led with it's time. And then these ripples of light coming through, what did they see as a result of these ripples of light coming through? Interesting. And this gyration of the three consolidates it's not quite the right word and dissolve isn't the right word either, but it goes from three to less like merging, like a blend. I get more of a feeling of more like a cease or a dissolve than happens. Okay. And are they able to tell which one dissolves and what happens to the beings on the one that dissolves? I immediately heard the one in the middle. Watching this gyration, it's like one of them does move less than the other two. And, oh, it's like oh, so much. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. It's almost like water. When it runs over the same spot of earth, it starts to wash it away. It's almost like this rotation is rubbing against it. And it's almost like dissolving. And I think the word she wants to use here, by the way, is eroding, right? Erosion. And what I'm hearing is that that which does not need to be is dissolving. And I'm trying to ask if that means that it goes from three to two, three to one, three to zero. And they're saying ultimately one, we're hearing for a while two, and it's almost like the two don't go together. The two are different. The point isn't to merge the two. It's almost like the one, the central one. Uh, okay, this is interesting. The central one is in place, was almost meant to anchor the other two. And that is the one that's dissolving because it's no longer needed. It's like an overlapping plane. That overlapping plane isn't needed anymore. Okay, are there beings that exist on the overlapping plane, on the middle one? I don't see any. Let me ask my new friends. They're telling me some live there. They're telling me that's their job. It's their choice. And not that it's a bad place to live, but it's not really pleasant, mainly because it's not very populated. I'm getting the analogy of like a cruise ship. All the passengers enjoy the ride, but the crew lives in the bottom couple decks and exists to serve the passengers. So I feel like this middle one is a grounding base for the other two. And I keep hearing the word anchor. It's like it was, it has anchored them together, anchored them in existence. It's anchored somehow. And it has served as an anchor for both of these other two. And it's no longer needed. Okay, so when the anchor dissolves, 
what happens to the other two in their perspective? Mm, they look distinct, but they also still overlap a little bit and they cease to move like they were before. So I'm asking them, what does this mean? What can you tell me about it? Uh, they're using one of my favorite phrases, which is people make choices. Okay, what are some of the choices that they see people making that would make them be on one earth versus the other one? Well, first of all, they're kind of showing me it's just like a choice of would you rather live in California or Florida? It's just preference. It's not right, wrong, good, bad. It's just you lived, you chose, you lived, you go. I'm trying to ask if there are certain behaviors or characteristics that make someone prefer one to the other, and I'm not sure. Okay, so they don't really respond to that line of questioning, huh? I don't know. Uh, maybe, do you have a better question? So this is, <laughs> this is a really, I love it when, when clients, like, uh, just as an aside, I love it when clients really help me be better at hypnosis because she's talking to these other world beings right and and they're not responding to my line of questioning so do you have a better question and she's and that's her question to me all right do they see anything distinguishing those two earth-like planets mm, in that question i focused on the people what i heard back with that is that some people don't want to live this way anymore that the way that we've lived on earth for quite some time has been fine and several of us have enjoyed it and there's no reason to change that for those who are happy with earth. But some do not want to do that anymore and that's what would make them want to live in a different place. So that's the difference between the two. Okay, so what would be the lifestyle in the one place versus the other place where people have been living? They're telling me the one where people have been living just looks like it does like us for us today. The one, the other one looks less densely populated. So I guess more people choose present earth than the other. Do they see any obvious choice point? Because from, of course, right where you and I are living right now, there's not an obvious choice. There's a thought of a choice, but not an obvious tangible physical choice like a door that we can open or a stairway to take did they see if there's an obvious choice at some point mm, i'm not hearing anything from that question okay do they feel that there's anything else that we should know about the future of earth and what's coming this way they're just expressing to me how beautiful and exciting it is they're emphasizing that everyone who currently lives on earth will end up on the earth they want to be on they're trying to explain it like a win-win. Everyone ends up happy and it goes back to choices. Beautiful. And they said it's really beautiful and exciting from their perspective. What did they see as really beautiful and exciting about this time at this present moment? The immediate thing I heard is that motion won't be limited. I feel like they're insinuating that, oh, they're showing me like a little kid will would collect fireflies and keep them in a jar. That's the analogy they're putting on all of earth. And so essentially, if you were to take the top off of the jar, you might have some flat fireflies that want to stay in there, but the option now exists to fly out, fly out of the jar. And that's what they think is really exciting. Beautiful. Great analogy. Absolutely great. And do they know how humans will be able to tell when it's lifted? Just like some fireflies may not even know that the lid came off. How will we know? I feel like they're saying it's already done. I'm hearing the question, did you look? Did you look to see if there was a lid? Or are you just flying around not noticing that the lid's off? Okay, thank you. Do you have any other insights that they would like to share with you today? specifically who you are to them, whether or not they know you beyond you being able to do the same thing that they can do. They're just telling me that they're very happy to converse with me. They're essentially calling me a sister from another place. So they appreciated the visit is how I feel. They appreciated the chance to converse with someone, someone who's similar, but so different. 
Beautiful. Did they have any questions for you? I don't think so. Okay, very good. And let's thank them for all the help and information they've given us today. It's very thought-provoking and insightful. And now if you'd like, you can move on. You can move on on this planet and talk to another group, or you can go off this planet. Well, I immediately look like I flew off the planet. And okay, let's go ahead and travel to wherever and whenever it is that you feel the need to go. If there's a place calling you, let's go. Otherwise, we will create a portal and travel through. Hmm, I'd like to look on that second earth. That's a great idea. Let's go there. So I'm just floating around, kind of like at the height of an airplane looking around. From my perspective, it looks a lot the same. But notably, I'm not seeing any clouds. Everything is just clear overall. It's just, it just looks cleaner, more vibrant, kind of like everything looks right after the rain. I'm floating over something that looks kind of like a lake or a reservoir up against mountains. To me, it looks like the terrain of Utah. Very good. Do you see any buildings or anything? Nope. Okay. It would be interesting to travel down towards where you live. That's funny. That's where I was just going. So any signs of modern life or human life? Yeah, there's buildings. I'm not sure there's as many buildings, but the aerial view looks similar. Do these buildings look more modern or futuristic or similar to what you would normally see? I think I'd call it similar. I mean, just to go with the theme, it just looks nicer, cleaner. It's weird. It's like I'm feeling some sort of hesitation, like I'm not supposed to see this. Almost like I'm looking, but I'm peeking through my fingers. Remember, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't okay. You're meant to see this right now. They won't show you anything you're not supposed to see. Okay, I'm getting drawn toward a park that's outside the city, and there's a woman who's walking through the park. What should I, what should I do to interact with her? Would you like to engage with her then? Yeah. Okay. Let's make sure your feet are firmly on the ground. And when you're ready, reach out with your mind or your words and ask if you could speak with her for a moment. She said yes. Perfect. Okay. Let's tell her where we're from. Present day earth in a hypnosis session. You can tell her that that as well and ask her if she'd be willing to answer a few questions. She said yes. Very good. Let's ask her what her experience is like in this place. She's just showing me daily activities. They're not things that I consider abnormal, but one of the things that's missing is, well, I don't see her getting in the car and driving to work. She's doing things like she's in her backyard. She has a clay pot. She's filling with water. She's watering some plants. She's hiking in the forest. She's interacting with other people, friends at a party. She's showing me they're outside. Beautiful. Does she have to work? Her immediate answer is yes. It's like a yes and it's not work. Okay, can she explain that? Essentially, it goes back to boredom. If she didn't do things that she found useful, she'd be bored. So it's not work necessarily for money like we experience, but work for purpose? Yeah, she keeps using the word useful. Very good. And does she remember at any time not being here, experiencing this, but being somewhere else? I'm getting the feeling, yes. It sounds like she's saying, I used to live over there and now I live here. Good, perfect. She's exactly who we want to talk to. Can she tell us her experience transitioning from one to the other? I hear choice. She had to make a choice. She had to believe. She's showing me, and she's kind of emphasizing this was her preference, but she's showing me this little scene where she was sitting down and she had lit, I kind of feel like her back is up against something. So I'm not saying she's sitting in a circle of this, but she had lit all these candles that are kind of in a tight circle around her. And I see her as something that looks like incense. And she's setting the intention that she wants to move to this place where she is now. And so it's almost like she held a little ceremony to strengthen her intention. 
And she's telling me that that was the catalyst for her. She's using the word jumping for her jump. Yeah, her jump. Very good. And does she remember when she did that? Okay, and remember, timelines are funky. So please don't write these in stone. Nothing like that. This is through hypnosis. We're talking to a person through another person and so on and so on. So, okay. So her answer, um, when I first brought up that I'm from present day earth, I immediately heard, heard her say 2025. Now what I'm trying to unravel here is whether or not she's saying that that's the time we're in or not, or now with this question that that's the, what she remembers when she said her intention. Okay. Let's ask her if there's a distinction there. She's saying that she did it before 2025. She's showing me 2025 is the time we're interacting in right now. And does she remember what happened before she made this choice? We were told about some ripples of energy. I'm curious if she knows what that means or if she experienced anything. I'm trying to convey this information to her about the ripples and the perspective of these other beings the way that she's explaining it is essentially some people on earth knew about this and believed it and some didn't know or didn't believe. And she's just saying that makes all the difference. I kind of got lost in the thread of everything she's showing me. Okay. Did she know about this from a certain source or did it come become clear at some point that this could be her future? The way it feels is essentially there's not an event. There's just a choice and she's showing this jump, almost like a, like you teach a kid, I don't know, to do hopscotch, like see, look, it's, it's safe, just like, just like this, just come on. So it's almost like after a choice was made, and the intention was set, then you jump to the reality of your choice. Did others go with her at that time? She says not at the same time. Okay, was she able to interact with others who were on the old version of Earth when she was over in the newer version of Earth? She said she didn't want to. It doesn't feel like it's something that's mean. It's more like it would be interrupting their choices. I keep hearing their life path, interrupting their life path. To communicate with them would interrupt that life path. She's telling me that she can see them if she chooses to, almost like I'm talking to her right now but she is very specific not to interact with them. Okay, does she remember any chaos or need for survival in her old life before this transition, before she jumped? Nope. Okay, would she like to tell us about any specific events that happened from present day Earth and before she left that would help us to know, to know about? I'm seeing, well, it's not the same in, in, image, but it's similar to the light patterns that were coming at the earth. So as far as an event goes, it looks like this light or these waves, they just kept coming. They just keep coming. It's not like one, I'm hearing the word catalyst, just whatever the word is for something that makes something else possible. So she feels like the light was a catalyst, the waves of light that kept coming. It helped to enable, and yes, from a more global sense, but from a more personal sense, sense it has to do with how you set the, set the intention, and the intention goes directly back to, did you have the knowledge? Very good. What helped her have the knowledge? She's just almost saying, like, everybody, all the people I know, know. Like, only dumb dumbs don't know. I mean, that's kind of her take on it. Interesting. And yet she set the intention. Yeah, similar to how if you wanted to move to Florida, you'd set the intention. I'm going to move from Texas to Florida, and then you'd do it. All right, what were some of her first experiences after she shifted to this new place? She showed me how she jumped essentially from her own backyard into her own backyard. And that helped her with the transition because everything that she jumped into was immediately familiar. Hmm, what did she notice as being different then? How did she know that she had jumped? She said that it was subtle differences, but noticeable, like not quite as if she had a garden where one didn't exist, but the foliage was different. 
So immediately she looked around and she was like, this was not here. And then started noticing other things like that. And she's showing me going over to the neighbor's house and asking, hey, have you noticed anything different? And they're like, yes, yes, welcome. Does she see new people show up regularly or no? Yeah, she says she does. Interesting. What are some of the kind of gifts that she's seen change within her? It's an interesting question because she's showing me that 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 walk over to the neighbor's house and it's it's not like anything's changed. Nothing's changed. I mean, it's not different then. And it's almost like she's showing me this dimmer switch. Like when you start to change that little dial and things start to come back in place at a speed that you can process it or that you can use it. And she's really specific that there's no time to it because it's based on someone's personal journey and preference. So I'm asking when someone turns on this dial, this flow, what happens to them or for them? Oh, and the first thing she showed me is the colors changing. The way that I would describe it is like being able to see auras, but not just of people, of any living structure. She's showing me the plants or even her coffee table that's made of wood has like a little field around it. I was just asking, you know, what else? The, okay, the way I would interpret this, she must be really into jumping because she's showing me the jumping again, but it's like across the street and it's an analogy. I mean, she's showing me like how she hops to another place and she's telling me it's much easier to get around. It's much easier to hop to another place. And so it's almost like she's showing me like first she hopped across the street and then she was able to hop into town. She's telling me that that's the furthest she likes to go. But just that's fun. Getting around is a lot easier. That is fun. Okay. What about things like telepathy? Has she experimented at all with that or had experiences with it? She's telling me yes. Uh, but there's like a hesitation there. I'm trying to figure out if it's hers or it's a collective thing. It, it feels collective. She's just telling me that it's a lot at once. It's a lot to hear, to adjust to your own new surroundings, and also to hear everybody else and their adjustment periods at the same time. So the way that she's describing it, at least for her, is that's just too much at first. Does she have control over turning it down? She told me she didn't turn it on. Oh, okay. So she has, does she have control over turning it on or not? I'm not sure she currently has the choice to do so. It's almost like features become unlocked, not quite on, on a time frame, but more like I'm hearing like a rolling map and I have no idea what that means. Can she tell you? She's showing me this image because I'm like, what's a rolling map? And so it's basically an image of getting like a dune buggy, and going off. It looks like you're going through the forest and you get to a certain campfire. And once you've seen that campfire and you're familiar with it, then it's almost like you're okay and you're clear to go forward. You go to the next campfire. So it's almost like a video game where you're like co collecting things and unlocking levels. Very interesting. Can she help us with something? Would she mind just a few minutes? She seems agreeable to do so, but she's not promising anything. Okay. I'm wondering if she can help us find you. Ooh. She says I didn't come, and I don't like that answer. And why is that? Why didn't you come yet? She can tell you. She's telling me that part of my job is to stay where I am a little bit longer than I'd want to because people will listen. If I could help get more information and more access to people, well, it goes back to the firefly jar. We have to tell as many people as we can that the lid is off. They don't have to fly out. That's not our job. That's not the responsibility. But part of what we signed up to do is to let people know the lid is off. She didn't have that responsibility. She has a responsibility to be more like um, the welcoming committee. It's not quite right, but she was supposed to go there, perhaps even earlier than most. Hmm. 
can she tell you maybe from this perspective, she can see some of the ways that you let people know the lid is off and how you can convince them of it? Well, she's kind of poking fun at social media, but also, you know, pointing out that the more that we use tools that get information in front of people, and she's saying, if you ask the right question, that's the point. It's not about telling them, hey, guys, the lid is off. It's about asking the questions that help them look up and doing it in a platform in a wide enough spot that as many people as possible can see it. And even if they think it's stupid, they heard it. And when they're ready to ask themselves that question and face the truth, they're more able to look up. Awesome. Okay. And let's ask her about that. Looking up is, is symbolic. What is the actual action step that people can take to test this idea that the lid is off? Well, it's an analogy of the looking up to see the lid is off the jar, noticing that there's freedom and there's choice. It's a metaphor. It's not an action. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are some of the things that she sees that people can use to test this freedom? Does she, does she want them to start manifesting things that they think are they're completely capable, incapable of? Because she's on the other side, so she can see this stuff. What helps them? Mm. The first thing you do is you listen to yourself. You listen to the things that you're thinking. Are they rooted in fear? Are they using, the way I'm hearing, hearing it is less productive language. Are they using negatives? Can't, won't, shouldn't. If that's where their thoughts are based, that's the first thing they have to notice. It's like a tipping point. There's a certain tipping point where she's saying, it's not that you can't have any of those thoughts, but if that's where your mind is based, you're not going to tip over to the next phase. I'm trying to do a motion of a teeter-totter. I don't know how else to describe it. Okay, so the first test is the thoughts, paying attention to the thoughts. Yes. Okay, and what kind of tips, tips, what, what kind of tips you a little bit more? Okay, yep, then, and then it's the intention of working in light and positivity as much as possible. And then I'm asking for the build, like if someone were to do steps, I mean, she's being fairly clear that you don't have to go in a certain order. Some people are already doing some of the steps, so they start on the ones a bit further down the path. You know, however, if we're going to put them in order, I'm hearing that one does not exist without the other. So there are the tipping points and the teeter totter with the thoughts. Then there was a whole idea of light and positivity. So it's like a shift. So it's almost like she's showing me four stones on this path. So those are the first two stones. I'm asking what's what the third stone is. And it does sound like that's the idea of manifesting proving to yourself that your thoughts create your reality and having that show up for you consistently. For the fourth stone in the path, she's showing me her little ceremony again. You truly intend to go somewhere else. So it's not just about the thoughts. It's about how the thoughts then start to encompass the entire being and that makes you a better conduit for this whole idea of light and positivity. And you can't manifest unless you're working from that space. And you can't manifest the intention or get somewhere else unless you've done this as a lifestyle. You've done this consistently. Very good. Okay. So you turn it into a lifestyle. Yes. Okay. And I'm also hearing with it, okay, if you come off the diet and eat ice cream, it's the idea of staying on the diet. It's just kind of like that comfort in knowing it's not like a perfect lifestyle. It's okay if you eat the ice cream, but it does require consistency. I'm hearing dedication, focus. I'm hearing her acknowledge that it's not easy. It's not easy for people to do that. We get caught up in the, in the chaos and the distraction. She's showing me these stones again. And she's like, it's so simple. Just a step from one to the next and one to the next and one to the next. But just because they're close together and it's easy to make that step doesn't mean it's literally easy to do. She's acknowledging that. Well, what are some of the things that she struggled with on her path? 
Oh, that's a really interesting question. She likes it. She's showing me, and this is, I think she, why she was so adamant that you don't start on a certain spot. Essentially, she came in further down the rock path. So she was predisposed to positive thoughts and working in light. So where she's showing me her, her trouble point was, or it just, she said it took a lot of trial and error to feel like she could manifest and create the world around her. And she's telling me that she had to, for her, start small. And it has a hundred percent to do with belief. You can't do that unless you fully believe it happens. And that's why for her and for most people, you have to start with something small and you wouldn't doubt to begin with. Beautiful. So when there was a result in that thing manifesting, it started a snowball effect and more and more belief in oneself and belief in manifestation. Okay, does she have any tips or tricks for you or for anybody else that she'd like to share right now beyond this fabulous information that she's already given us? Well, what's coming through right now is that I am her. I'm just trying to unravel if that's a metaphor or if, or if she's talking more literally, and I really can't hear the answer to that. Would she like to show you what she means instead of just tell you? Well, immediately that then gave me the image of both of us standing on the third ra rock. When I say rock, they kind of look like garden pavers. I mean, they're nice little flat rocks that you just walked on a path down a nice and easy way. So we're both on that third rock. So that third rock, is that manifestation then? Yes. And does she feel like there's anything, any shifts and beliefs that you need to make right now on that third rock? Interesting question. Yes, the reason why it's an interesting question is she's saying that's exactly the point. She was trying to tell me that it was hard for her at this point because this is where it's hard for most people, myself included. She's saying when you start to feel small successes, successes, oh Lord, successes, <laughs> and you ask for something and it doesn't come. She's saying it erodes your faith. But there's something behind that, and it ties back to this old dowsing quote of the answer's always right. What's the question? It's not that the outcome was, was wrong. It was that something didn't line up. And so people start to feel like they can't do it. And technically speaking, they can't because something wasn't aligned. You know, they didn't do something exactly the same way or just it's hard to describe. Well, that's a good point. What does she recommend that a person does when their results point out that they weren't aligned? What are some good things to kind of audit within their thoughts or within their manifestation beliefs? What does she recommend people go back to at that point? Mm, she's showing me that the problem is, well, the metaphor she's using is like these tiny little pebbles. It's not, it's not usually the big stuff. It's the tiny little things like maybe there was a drop of a seed of doubt or, oh, she said, there's, this is a really big one where people aren't necessarily focused and they let another thought creep in at the same time. And that confused the process. She's actually saying that there are four common errors. One of them is that seed of doubt. One of them is getting distracted and adding something else in. One of them has to do with other people and one of them, hold on. I'm just trying to hear them fast. Oh, okay. I'll have to go back to the other people because I was hearing so much of that, that I got distracted from before. It ties back to free will. And she's essentially explaining that if you're trying to manifest and you're including someone else, it almost automatically won't work. If you're trying to manifest and it changes someone else's outcome, if you're trying to do it for someone else, it almost never works. In the manifestation that will affect someone, it's almost like she's showing me a ratio where it only has a 60% chance of su success. <laughs> Lord. And it's this big thing about how your free will and your intention affects things. She's showing me the ripple effect around the beings around you. So it has to do to some degree with this idea of benevolence. She's saying that it doesn't matter whether or not you have the best intentions or are you benevolent. It's more about what we say here on this earth about 
things lining up for the highest and best good. If somewhere down that ripple effect, it's not for someone else's highest and best good, we might not notice that. We might not know it in advance. And that's one of the reasons why it can't happen. So she's just saying as an action item with this, just be really careful, especially when we're trying to prove this to ourselves, because then this would go back to point number one, when we're trying to prove that manifestation works. So it's not about setting the intention that it's only for us, but when we're trying to decide what to manifest, especially when we're trying to prove it to ourselves, we have to keep it almost in our own little silo and pick out things that we're going to try that we really do believe will only affect us or maybe a small amount of people around us. And it really is in their highest and best good. That's going to get us a better chance of success. And then that will go back to feeding that whole confidence that we can do it. Whew, that feels like a lot of information at once. Amazing information. Thank you for auditing when it goes wrong, how to fix it, right? And what kind of check off as a step? What to kind of check off as a step? These are wonderful. Well, there's a fourth one, just trying to hear it. Is there a question? Sometimes it works better when you ask the questions. Okay, yes. She said there was a four, there were four different pebbles, right? Things that we should check for when the manifestation doesn't work. And so she already labeled three of them. What is the fourth pebble for what we should check if manifestation doesn't work? She mentioned the seed of doubt, focus, and other people in their free will. And I was curious what the other one was. Yeah, with this, I immediately heard the words grounding and anchoring. It's like grounding it into our reality, anchoring it. And the other word that goes along with this is accepting it. She says it pisses them off. And I don't know who them are when we ask for stuff and then we get it and we're like, meh, I'm good. Okay. And that's the idea of accepting it and grounding it into our reality. I mean, the image she's showing me is basically like, if you're getting tossed, I don't know, like not quite a, not quite a flagpole, but something like that. You grab it and you immediately claim it and you'd stick it in your yard like, this is mine. And so it goes along with all of that kind of stuff where you're accepting it, you're claiming it, you're owning it, you're grounding it, you're anchoring it into your existence. And so if you don't do that, it's not going to work or you think it doesn't work. You perceive it doesn't work. And then right back to number one, we are. So would she then say that a good workaround for that would be only to try to manifest things you actually are interested in claiming that aren't just meh, like don't just manifest a feather that you're not super into having? Well, her first answer was duh. So that's why I started kind of laughing. Oh, it's a duh for some who are already further along that path. But for people who aren't, because you're going to be teaching some of this, oh, this is me. Sorry, I got to change my voice. So it's a duh for some who are already further along the path, but for people who aren't, and because you're going to be teaching some of this for people who aren't, would that be the workaround then? Only manifest things that you really want to claim? Well, she just wants me to acknowledge the fact that she's saying this with a smile and with love, but she was kind of teasing, like, yeah, manifest stuff you want. However, she wanted to speak specifically to your example. She said that that's ex actually a good example of starting small. And in that specific case, grounding and anchoring to your reality doesn't have to be that now you create the shrine in your office to this feather that you found, you know, two years ago. It's more about I'm seeing her. Um, this is a weird analogy, but like when certain cultures or people hand you a business card, it's rude if you don't look at it and really acknowledge it and honor it, like nod to it and thank them for giving it to you. So that's the analogy or the view that it looked like with this feather. Like you have to acknowledge it. You have to, to thank, you have to accept. And then if you don't choose to keep it, that's okay. But it's something about that recognition. So it's kind of like this was created by us. This is a gift for you. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, oh, this is me again. Thank you for explaining that. Do you have any questions for her about this process of getting to this point of making that jump and recognizing that freedom is available and the lid is off through these simple steps, 
seemingly simple, simple, but actually take time, take effort, take energy. Do you have any questions for her? Because remember, we're asking what are some of the ways that you are going to be showing people that the lid is off, right? Since you're, you're staying to do that very specific work. Do you have any questions for her about your work and your ripple effect? Oh, there's a lot of, to unpack there. Oh, sorry about that. Originally with questions for her, the first thing that I heard was, how do I live on your earth? Like, how do I switch? Not with the goal of, you know, sh shrink, shirking duty. That was the first thing that I thought of is how do I get there? And so the answer was, oh, interesting. She's, a, she's essentially showing that people who live where she lives, it interrupts the life path to come to the other earth. So that's why she was conscious not to do that. However, that's not true of people who choose. Oh, now we're back to the fireflies. You can live in the jar and still fly out because you knew the lid was off and go somewhere else and then go back and sit in the jar again. So it's essentially like just because you've chosen to live on a specific earth, on the original earth, doesn't mean that you can't experience the same thing. I'm hearing that it's almost like you create your home base and that's your starting point. So at your home base, you have to live how you'd want to live on the other earth. And she's saying from that, from there, it grows. I mean, it's not like then that's, that's home base. And every time you leave your home base, it's chaos. She's saying that the more you root that into your reality on this earth, the more when you leave your space, oh, it looks symbiotic. It almost looks like when you go to the next place, like for example, a target or a department store, when you go there, you're not going to be in a version of Target that's actually, a, or you are going, you're now going to be in a version of Target that's actually aligned with how you're approaching this version of Earth. So the people are nicer, the products are in stock, like you're having a better experience while you're there. But it also look like looks like it's symbiotic where when you're going to those places and you're rooted in this energy of a higher Earth, it rubs off on other people even though they don't, um, I'm hearing, smell it. Very good. Wonderful. So you can merge the two, if you will, within your experience by living as if, by rooting how you want to live on the new earth, in this older earth. Yes. But essentially, it's like you're living on the new earth when you're in these little zones, and the zones are metaphorical. So it could be literally like, this is my zone, this is my home base, and that'd be more literal. But when you're in this energetic zone and flowing state, it's like your other experiences here on the earth would actually mirror and mimic what she experiences over there too. And it's touching a higher amount of people. So then, and not to be the devil's advocate here, but what would be the point then in actually transitioning fully to the new earth and rather than staying on the old earth? Well, the way she's describing it is that this is a limited time opportunity. So it's not a permanent situation. It's not going to be okay forever. And at some point you live where you live. The way I'm hearing it, because I was just shown this image again, that third anchor point that I saw before with the marble looking things, when that dissolves away, and that was the anchor point, grounding point for these two earth, earths, that's when it's harder to get between them. The analogy that I'm hearing with that is right now, it's not too terribly hard to get from Austin to Denver. You hop on an airplane, you hop in a car, whatever. And so you can do that. So it's like the same thing. You can get between these two earths and it's not like that big of a deal. But at some point getting between the two, it's going to be more like taking a rocket to the moon. It's just not as everyday accessible. Very good information. Okay. And when, when does she see that happening? She's saying that it's happened, uh, you know, in 2025, it's already happened or where she's there and you're still on the old earth in 2025. So when did she see this actually dissolving? And the first thing she said was a while. And so I asked, well, what is a while to you? And she's not really giving me any information. Okay. And does she feel like your job will eventually be accomplished? You, your purpose eventually be accomplished on the old earth and you will transition? Yeah. 
Very good. Does she have any other insights into what you'll feel or notice when you've reached that threshold? Well, the first thing she showed me is I, I'll feel really warm. <laughs> Actually, she's reminding me of a dream that I recently had that just tie, just ties together. So there were these people who were experiencing almost like a mass upgrade. And one of the things that they were always saying was, this is so warm. I feel warm. And they were happy about how warm they were. So she said, I'll feel it. It's something that I can physically feel. But she said that I won't need to physically feel it because I'll also know it. I'll kind of, it's kind of like an analogy she's using when you know your kid's too old for high school. You know that they're ready to be an adult, but they just haven't quite graduated yet. You're waiting with that painful process of, yes, I know, senior year sucks. We'll be out of this soon. Like, you'll know. I love that. Very good. Okay. Would she like to tell you anything else before we move on very quickly to the higher self? And let's see. And she said, thanks for stopping by. She doesn't have any more information. And I said, thank you back. She's been a wealth of information and I'd like permission um, to maybe someday speak with her again when we're on the new earth. And at this point, we'll end this session because as the client moves on to the higher self, it's not super Im important uh, for a collective to hear this stuff. It, and it's also very brief because we spent most of our time on the new earth talking to this very, very helpful welcoming committee. So thank you guys for listening to this. Um, it took a while to get it out, but I'd also like to thank my client so much. She did so much work. Oh my God. Dealing with me on one side and then the, and then the welcoming committee on the other side and just translating back and forth. What a trooper. Okay. Thank you. I hope this helps somebody out there. It's beautiful information, a lot to unpack. So good luck with that. And you take care. So much love. Bye-bye.